So what is cerebral palsy? Well, according to your textbook, it's defined as, quote, a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture, causing activity limitations that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. And the causes of CP aren't really completely understood. We know that cerebral palsy is often associated with prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal events um, that may include hypoxic, ischemic, infectious, congenital, or traumatic brain insults. Um, however, there's a large number of cases of cerebral palsy where we never really know the cause. Um, premature birth, atypical uterine growth, as well as multiple births and genetic factors may all contribute to cerebral palsy. So how is cerebral palsy diagnosed? Well, a clinical diagnosis is made when a child does not reach early motor milestones and exhibits abnormal muscle tone or qualitative differences in movement patterns. So some of the things that we'll look at is assessment of symmetry, involuntary movements, and abnormal primitive reflexes, as well as late development of postural reflexes. And all of those things may contribute to the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Um, cerebral palsy really is sort of just this umbrella term that does cover and capture um, kind of a wide variety of, of brain injuries in children. And there's really no consensus on how early CP can be reliably identified. Um, a lot of children who are preterm or who have um, anoxic um, brain injuries actually will show some sorts of transient early neurological signs, which they at times will actually grow out of. So this can really make early diagnosis difficult. And what you'll see is that oftentimes um, physicians may be reluctant to make a diagnosis of cerebral palsy till the child is, you know, one or two or even three years old. Um, however, um, Many cases of cerebral palsy can be identified in children much younger, um, even at age six months or younger. And it is important when we're trying to figure out um, a diagnosis of cerebral palsy that we differentiate from other conditions, atypical uh, motor trajectories, and again, that transient dystonia that's often associated with prematurity. We have to make sure that we rule out a number of other diagnoses so that we know what we're really dealing with is cerebral palsy. So how is cerebral palsy classified? Well, um, historically, we've classified cerebral palsy based on the impaired area of the body and the movement abnormality. So monoplegia refers to um, only one limb affected. That's pretty rare. Um, diaplegia refers to all four limbs are affected, but the legs are much more affected than the arms. Hemiplegia refers to involvement of just one side of the body, so one arm and leg on one side of the body. And then quadriplegia refers to involvement of all four limbs. And we look at the movement abnormality, we see that there are, one of the most common type is spastic cerebral palsy, where we actually have spasticity of the muscles. There's also dyskinetic or athetoid cerebral palsy, where we'll actually see fluctuating tone, um, kind of writhing movements. These children may have um, really low tone in the trunk and very high tone in the arms. Ataxic cerebral palsy um, refers to um, ataxic type presentation, so um, lots of problems with balance and coordination. And then finally, hypotonic cerebral palsy, uh, which is characterized by low, low muscle tone. And when we think about um, the different areas of the brain that may be injured in each of these types. Um, spastic cerebral palsy is usually associated with injury to the motor cortex or white matter projections. Dyskinetic and athetoid cerebral palsy refers to, is usually associated with an injury of the basal ganglia. And ataxic cerebral palsy is associated with injury to the cerebellum. And there's not a single site that is associated with hypotonic cerebral palsy. And this just gives kind of a breakdown of the um, kind of frequency that we'll see the different types of cerebral palsy. So you can note that spastic diplegia is actually the most common. 38% of cerebral palsy we see is spastic diplegia, um, followed by spastic hemiplegia, which is about 30%. About 5.5% of the cerebral palsy we see is spastic quadriplegia. 9.5% is dystonia. 5.5% is athetosis. 11% is ataxia, and then in 2% of cases we see a mixed type of cerebral palsy. So we may see mixed um, 
spastic quadriplegia with apoptosis or something similar. Now, a more contemporary way to classify cerebral palsy is actually by using the gross motor function classification system. Now, we talked about the gross motor function measure, and the gross motor function classification system is different. Um, this is not a standardized test. This is actually just a classification system for children with cerebral palsy. It's five levels, and children are categorized by level and their age. It places children with cerebral palsy in categories of severity based on performance and functional motor skills such as sitting, walking, and wheeled mobility. Um, there are actually four age bands, birth to two, two to four, four to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18. So based on the child's performance in these functional skills and their age, they're actually classified into one of the five levels. And research has shown that the GMFCS is actually highly reliable and valid um, it's stable over time, so once children are classified, they typically don't change levels over time. And this is particularly true at preschool age and older. So the birth to two-year-old age um, band may be a little bit less reliable, but once we get up into the two to four age range and above, um, this is a, a highly reliable, uh, valid, and very stable way of classifying children. So this is just an example of um, one of the age bands of the gross motor function classification system. You can see this it shows descriptors and illustrations for children between age 6 and 12. And it goes through here um, what you would see for level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, and level 5. So you can read through those descriptions. And I've actually provided you with a full copy of the Gross Motor Function Classification System extended and revised, so that's what the E and R stands for. Um, that's the second edition um, that's posted for you. So you can look through and kind of see what the descriptors are for each level at each um, age range. But this just gives you one example of how that might look. Now, these are um, gross motor development curves created by Hannah Rosenbaum and Bartlett using the gross motor function classification system um, along with the gross motor function measure. So you'll see here along the um, left side here, you see the GMFM66, that uh, refers to the gross motor function measure. And then along the bottom here, you see the ages in years and then you'll see the different levels. So basically um, what they did is they stratified the children by age and gross motor function classification level and then they administered the gross motor function measure repeatedly to these children and they um, ended up creating gross motor development curves that represent the average pa pattern of development for children in each of the five classification levels. So um, you can see that a couple things that are important here is that first of all you can see that at any level, so levels 1 through 5, we really see that gross motor function um, tends to plateau in around the age of, of 5 or so. And we do know based on this work that in all levels that children reach about 90 percent of their gross motor potential between the age of three and six. So lots and lots of gross motor development happening in those early years and then we sort of tend to maybe have some small increases in gross motor development but not, not necessarily really large. Um, for all five levels, children progress faster to their maximum gross motor function uh, measure score at younger ages, which then is followed by this leveling off which you can see in levels one and two, there's actually leveling off. And levels three, four, and five, we actually see then a decline that occurs over time. So you can see at level um, five, the peak is about age six and a half. At level four, we peak at about age seven. And then in level three, we peak at about age eight or so. And then over time, those those actually decline. And remember, the levels 3, 4, and 5 are actually our more severely affected children. So what this shows is that in our children who have more severe cerebral palsy, they actually have more of a decline over time. And what's really exciting and impressive about these gross motor development curves is that they really give us, a, uh, for the first time, uh, a way that we can kind of come up with a prognosis um, for families. So we can 
we can really help families understand the outlook for gross motor function and also determine whether a child's progress is consistent with patterns of other children with CP of similar ages and severity. So we can kind of take these curves and we can look at a child, for example, who we're seeing with who's a level three and who's eight years old, and we can see if their GMFM score is similar to other children eight years old who are level threes. And then we can sit down with families with these gross motor curves and we can kind of show them what we might be able to expect. Um, we can sit down with them with the actual gross motor function classification system tool and explain that if at age two to four they are a level three, that, you know, what what does a level three look like at age 12 to 18? And we can sit down with that family and show them sort of an idea of what they can expect. And so that can be really powerful for helping families understand what to expect and even our own program planning as we, as we try to determine what kind of skills and goals are realistic for children with cerebral palsy. So moving into discussion of the body function and structure um, impairments of children with cerebral palsy. Um, first of all, that one that comes immediately to mind is issues with muscle tone and extensibility. Usually we do see high or low muscle tone in CP. Um, tone all, generally actually increases up to age 4 and then might decrease to age 12, but different children have really different patterns um, of development of tone. It's not unusual to see a newborn that's really floppy um, eventually develop a high tone over time. Spasticity is often associated with clonus, pathological reflexes, and certain postural and movement patterns. And um, this problem with tone actually gets worse over time. Children, muscles in children with CP may not relax during activity and muscle growth often doesn't keep up with bone growth. And so this kind of creates this vicious cycle of chronic muscle imbalance, abnormal posture, weakness, and abnormal reflex activity um, in these children. Moving on to muscle strength, um, children with CP aren't able to generate normal voluntary muscle forces. And so this is, then results in activity limitations such as poor walking speed and poor gross motor function. So strength is definitely an issue in this population. Skeletal abnormalities are also an issue. Um, impa impairments in muscle strength and extensibility um, can result in abnormal biomechanical forces that comprise the bone and joints. So when we see ab bony abnormalities such as scoliosis and hip subluxation and dislocation, all of these things are fairly common in CP. Selective control, postural control, and motor learning also um, can be difficult for children with cerebral palsy. Um, oftentimes children with CP have difficulty isolating their muscles in selected pattern and responding to postural challenges. They can have problems learning new movements and um, have limitations in cognition and perceptual motor skills as well as a lack of opportunity to practice these skills. So that can all kind of lead um, into their problems with motor learning. And then pain is also a common complaint of children with cerebral palsy. So looking at interventions in the infant with cerebral palsy, um, the, may, the primary concern with when dealing with an infant with cerebral palsy is to educate the families and the caregivers. Um, parents can be very uneasy about having a child with cerebral palsy, and so we really want to just promote their skill, ease, and confidence in handling and caring for their infant. Um, handling and positioning should encourage active movements and encourage ex the experience of normal movements and postures. And so we may need to use equipment to facilitate activities such as sitting and standing. Um, we may need to position babies in a you know, lying position using towel rolls and other props to kind of help get them in a typical position, for example, with their hands together at midline. So we really want to focus on, on handling and positioning that really promotes that typical, um, those typical movement patterns and typical postures. At this age, we also want to facilitate um, optimal sensory motor development. Um, we need to focus on well-aligned postural stability and smooth mobility to allow for attainment of motor skills and milestones. The normal motor developmental sequence is, is optimal, and that's what we're trying to take the child to, and that certainly may guide our interventions, but physical therapists should understand that children with cerebral 
palsy don't necessarily always follow a quote normal sequence. And so although it's important to go through those normal developmental milestones, um, therapy may need to be more functionally oriented at times. As children with cerebral palsy move into preschool ages, um, we really want to just optimize their gross motor skills and reduce and prevent secondary impairments. So as you can imagine, um, the spasticity in a child with cerebral palsy can oftentimes lead to the second, secondary impairment of um, orthopedic deformities. So we may need to um, really look at spasticity management, orthoses, and weight-bearing programs for children with CP to prevent those secondary impairments. We also want to promote play, um, communication, self-care, social skills, and problem-solving skills in addition to the motor skills that we're looking at. And we really want to um, think back to our motor learning principles where we want to encourage movement exploration, child-initiated solutions to motor tasks, and adaptations to changes in the environment as well as uh, repetitive practice of goal-related functional tasks that are meaningful to the child. So we really want to encourage all of those things um, in order to optimize gross motor skills and promote play and self-care. And then, of course, in this age, we really want to promote mobility. So if ambulation is appropriate and it's indicated, we want to work on you know, preparatory ambulatory activities. We want to give children ambulatory aids uh, if needed. Um, oftentimes, we see children with cerebral palsy use posterior walkers, and uh, those are often used in pediatric, uh, pediatric patients as research shows that those types of walkers tend to encourage a more upright posture, promote a better quality gait, and decreased energy expenditure. Now for some children, walking may be impossible or inefficient, and for those kids we really need to try to find an alternative means of mobility. So of course we may look at um, a manual chair that they would push on their own, or a power mobility device for the child to drive themselves, um, but even things such as uh, an adaptive tricycle, or a commercially available motorized, you know, little toy truck or things can be used with kids by kids with cerebral palsy to get around and can sometimes be adapted um, for them to use for for mobility. Moving into school age, um, as we discussed with the gross motor um, if gross motor function classification system, um, we do know that most children reach their optimal gross motor function at early ages. So by the time we've gotten to school age, we can assume, again, every child is different, but that for the most part, they've, they've achieved their optimal level of gross motor function. And so improvement is certainly possible um, for some school age children and adolescents. But at this age, um, PT really focuses on um, maintenance, um, age appropriate participation, uh, monitoring challenges that may occur with adolescents such as growth of puberty, pain, loss of a muscle extensibility, overuse injuries, as well as a more demanding lifestyle. lifestyle. Um, therapy at this age may focus on prevention of secondary impairments, um, problem solving to overcome environmental and societal barriers. Self-management is really important that children are learning to, to manage their own um, condition and their own life. And we also want to continue to focus on mobility. But as the children age, they may actually require different devices. So they may um, improve and need less a, a less restrictive device or the demands of their environment you know they may need to be um, going longer distances or community mobility may be more of a factor as they get older so we may actually start to look at wheelchairs and power mobility for kids where we weren't before so we have to just consider all of those things but really we're school and community participation and recreation are key and we really want to start thinking about transition planning once we get into children in school age. And as we know, um, IDEA requires that we start transition planning at age 16. But even before that, we should really be thinking about how this child is going to transition to their uh, to an adult lifestyle. And we know that successful transition to, to an adult lifestyle is characterized by self-determination, enhanced knowledge of self and community, problem solving and decision making skills, identification of support system as well as supportive environment. So we want to really try to work on getting all of those things in place early on so that the child um, is able to transition to adult life. <laughs>